You know, I don't do a lot on Donald Trump, but sometimes there's lessons with these ongoing legal fights involving President Trump that's helpful to you to understand how the legal system works. Because our Second Amendment rights are protected not just by the Second Amendment itself, but by the structures, the constitutional structures, the legal system, and other institutions in our great country, all of which are supposed to work together in various ways to ensure that our fundamental freedoms, including the right to bear arms, is not infringed upon. And so with that said, I want to talk briefly about this special counsel Jack Smith attempt to prevent Donald Trump from going to the Supreme Court and why this is the height of hypocrisy. Stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss this. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Moxes Dine, a proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarm, what the Ukraine War teaches Americans about the right to bear arms. All right, folks, I want to do this briefly. As you know, there's an ongoing fight involving the January 6th issue, where Donald Trump has been indicted in a D.C. court by a D.C., uh, in front of a D.C. judge, anticipated for a D.C. jury to hear this case. And he's been indicted by the special counsel, Jack Smith, even though there's questions about whether or not Jack Smith has the legal authority to do what he's doing, given the fact he's never been appointed by the president and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in any regards. Nevertheless, let's set the issue aside and talk specifically about what's going on in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. So here's where it stands right now. You may recall about a month or six weeks ago, Jack Smith, the special prosecutor, went directly to the United States Supreme Court and said to them, that the Donald Trump question of whether or not he has presidential immunity from prosecution arising from the January 6th issue and anything else for that matter. He would go, he, Jack Smith argued to the U.S. Supreme Court that the only court that should really weigh in on this is the U.S. Supreme Court and they should skip over the lower courts entirely and go right to the U.S. Supreme Court for a ruling prior to judgment because this is such a big deal. The U.S. Supreme Court denied that request by Jack Smith and sent it down for further consideration in the normal course. And that normal course consisted of an oral argument, an argument before the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Well, that judge, uh, that panel, of course, was um, overwhelmingly left leading Biden appointees, I believe. And they issued a ruling that said that Donald Trump is not immune from prosecution for the issues associated with January 6th, and thus special counsel Jack Smith can carry forward with this case. Now, here is where it gets a little geeky and frankly pathetic in my opinion. So hear me out. You're going to want to hear this because you're not going to really hear this anywhere else. So, as you know from our Second Amendment discussions, when a three-judge panel issues a ruling on an issue, a litigant has the opportunity to seek an appeal to a higher court so, for example, if a three-judge panel in the Ninth Circuit lose it, you know, rules against you, you can immediately seek certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court as one option. But there's another option, and that is to go to the Ninth Circuit on bonk and to say to the Ninth Circuit that you want to have your case heard on bonk by the entire Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit's a little squirrely because you only get a percentage of the, of the Ninth Circuit, not the whole Ninth Circuit because it's such a big circuit, but you get the point. So here's the key point, that... You know that in Second Amendment litigations or all litigations, again, if you lose at the three-judge panel, you can either seek en banc review or go to the higher court, usually the Supreme Court. Guess what happened here? So this three-judge panel in the District of Columbia ruled against President Trump. Now, what should have occurred is that Donald Trump should have had the option to seek an en banc review by the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Okay, that's what he should have had the option. And then if they granted it, the D.C. Circuit would have weighed in on Bonk. And if they denied it, then he could have gone to the U.S. Supreme Court. His time would not have expired. Or Donald Trump could have gone directly to the Supreme Court. Now, what he likely would have done in the normal course, and you'll see why he could not do this because he was prevented from doing it. He would have sought on Bonk review by the D.C. Court of Appeals. And they would have decided yes or no, and then it would have gone from there. But here's the key part. You're not going to read anywhere else, or it's going to be hard to find this. That three-judge panel of Biden people, you know what they did to Donald Trump? I'll tell you what they did. They issued their order that said that Donald Trump is not allowed 
to do an en banc review. Or if he does, they basically said he could do an en banc review, but seek an en banc review would not be a basis to delay the lower court case. You hear what I just said? Because as these appeals are occurring involving presidential immunity, the trial court is stayed from acting, meaning they cannot do discovery, they can't get ready for trial, anything like that. As long as this presidential immunity question is in the appellate courts, the trial court is not allowed to act, okay? Until what's known as a mandate issues. And what happened here was that the DC Court of Appeals said that they are not gonna hold back on issuing the mandate even if Donald Trump seeks on bonk review. So they basically gave, told Donald Trump that unlike every other litigant in America, including Bonta out there in California, that if he seeks en banc review, they were not going to stay the lower court decision because they were going to issue what's known as the mandate, which would allow the lower court to continue on with the case, even if Trump sought en banc review in the D.C. Circuit, and even if it was granted. So they treated Donald Trump in the D.C. court of court system there differently than they treat every other American. As a consequence, President Trump had no choice but to immediately seek review directly to the United States Supreme Court, which meant that he basically waived or could not take advantage of the opportunity to try to get an en banc review in the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. You see that game that was just played against Donald Trump? Now, you may like Trump. You may hate Trump. We can have that discussion in a different context. But whatever we want to say about this is that there is clearly two systems of justice playing out. If you're Donald Trump and his supporters, you get one system of justice. And if you're anyone else, you get a different system of justice. Okay, that's what's going on here. Now, it gets in some ways even worse. Remember how I mentioned at the start of this video that Jack Smith, the special counsel, about six month, six weeks ago or so was t saying that the only court that could really weigh in on presidential immunity questions involving President Trump is the U.S. Supreme Court, okay? And the Supreme Court said, no, go back to the D.C. Circuit. Well, Jack Smith just won in the D.C. Circuit. Now, Donald Trump is seeking certiorari from the U.S. Supreme Court. And guess what Jack Smith's position just filed says? Now Jack Smith, the special counsel, is saying, hey, we don't need the Supreme Court to get involved at all. You can just butt out. Do you see how he's literally taken the opposite position from where he was six weeks ago? Six weeks ago it was, hey, we, don't, we need the Supreme Court above all else. Now it's like we don't need the Supreme Court at all. So that's the sort of hypocrisy we're seeing among the special counsel's office and other people on the left. Again, two systems of justice. Now, with all that said, I just want to flag the two questions presented by the Trump case involving presidential immunity. As a general matter, people in elective office are immune from their official acts. The issue here is that on January 6, 2021, President Trump was the president of the United States and the chief, not just the commander in chief of the military, but really the chief law enforcement officer of federal law and so on. So here you have Jack Smith has now indicted him for conduct that President Trump allegedly engaged in as the president of the United States. Now, this has given rise to a whole host of constitutional questions that I'm not going to try to answer in this video, but I want to flag them for you just so you understand. And keep in mind that understand how all constitutional law works is helpful to you and understand how the legal system works is helpful to you in the Second Amendment community because a lot of what we do in the law is draw analogies from other aspects of the law. And the more you know about the law generally and how it all works, the better it is for you to protect your rights, not just Second Amendment rights, but all of your rights. And the metaphor I always like to use with my young associates uh, when I ran my law firms and all that stuff, and also with clients, is the way to think about a legal problem is a spider web. And then we're going to get back, by the way, to the issues of what's presented in front of the Supreme Court in the Trump immunity case. The way I like to explain to you know, associates and to clients is that legal problems are like a big spider web. And that every one of those spider webs has a strand, right? Many strands. And the critical thing to be an excellent high-end lawyer is to understand that when you grab a single strand and make a single decision or act in a single particular way, in a particular case or a legal situation, you grab a single strand and you pull on it, the entire spider web is going to move. And 
excellent lawyers are capable of understanding that whatever that little spider, whatever that little strand is you pull, you got to understand how the enti- it's going to affect the entire web and how the whole web's going to move. That's mission critical so that you don't make strategic mistakes and you think you're doing something good on Wednesday, but then it comes back and bites you on the butt a week later or a month later or 10 years later. So that's why really what's critically important here. So I only mention that uh, in this context, because this is an example where Jack Smith six weeks ago said the Supreme Court is mission critical and has to be decided and everything is, has to be about the Supreme Court. And today he's taken the opposite viewpoint. So he should be, had been very sensitive to he might have been in this posture when he made his arguments, you know, six weeks to a month ago. So again, just an example how you always need to be looking down the chessboard when you're involved in the law. And relatedly, in order to understand how all the web moves, it's very important that you understand other aspects of the Constitution and other aspects of law to make sure you protect your right to keep and bear arms because it's all intertwined as one great big web. Okay, with that said, what are the two issues or couple issues presented by the Trump case involving presidential immunity? And I think the big ones are this, is to what degree President Trump you know, was acting in his official capacity where he's got immunity and arguably was not acting in his official capacity? And is it even possible for the President of the United States while being president to ever have such a thing as not an official capacity because he is the president 24-7 and is surrounded by the military, so on, so on, 24-7 while he, is, he or she is in office. There's two other aspects of the Constitution that you need to be aware of that touch fingers with this immunity case. One is double jeopardy. Double jeopardy says that you cannot be convicted twice or tried twice of the same crime. So here you have President Trump saying that for anything associated with January 6th, he was already impeached by the House of Representatives in 2021, and he was acquitted by the United States Senate in 2021. And because Jack Smith, the special counsel, has indicted him for essentially the exact same acts, the same situation, the same date, everything associated with January Smith, uh, January 6th, I should say, not Smith, um, Donald Trump has already been exonerated. So as a matter of double jeopardy, Jack Smith cannot re-indict him and retry him for something he was already indicted for in the U.S. House and tried and exonerated in the U.S. Senate. So that's a big question here. Is there a double jeopardy component? And to the extent the impeachment clause or in the impeachment cl- judgment clause uh, plays a role here, has he now been essentially acquitted uh, and cannot be charged again. Beyond that, of course, keep in mind you have the separation of powers issue, which the Supreme Court has to be very careful about. There's three branches of government here. You have the executive branch, which is Article 2 of the the Constitution that creates the presidency. You have Article 3, which creates the federal court system. And you have Article 1, which uh, creates the Congress. You have the Congress, you have the presidency, and of course, you have the courts. So there's always concern about one branch of government being able to lord over another branch of government to there's got to be some give and take and separation of powers there you know in the lines and in the tendons if you will um, but the reality is you got to be very careful about this and I think the U.S. Supreme Court in the presidential immunity case involving President Trump is going to say do we really want a situation where the federal court system is going to be able to punish another exec, you know, either the presidency or somebody in the House or the Senate, is this going to somehow unduly impact in a negative way the delicate balance of powers that we have between the different branches of governments? So when considering whether or not federal courts can hear trials and can hear cases against another member of another branch of government, that is a big institutional question because you never want the president to to be able to lord over the other branches and you don't want the other branches of government to be able to lord over the president. And I think one of the big issues in this immunity case is to what degree would you want the federal court system and federal judges and federal juries to be able to lord over, if you will, the president of the United States for acts that he or she took as the president of the United States. And I think that is a big question constitutionally that the Supreme Court is going to be confronting in this case. The last thing I want to just mention is a timing issue. If you and I had a case and we petitioned for certiorari today in February 2024, do you know what would happen? We would not be heard this term. Undeniably, we have already missed kind of the internal deadline of the Supreme Court to have a case heard, argued, and decided in this term, which started in October 2023 and will end in June of 2024. The reason why I bring this up is if the Trump case is going to be treated like any other litigation in America, what should happen is that the Supreme Court should decide whether or not to hear this 
case and grant certiorari in this case. And if they do so, they would hear the case sometime in the fall of 2024 as part of their 2024-2025 Supreme Court term. So to the extent the Supreme Court either uh, decides to hear this case, but they decide to hear this case this term, meaning before June of 2024, Four, uh, that will again be a situation where they're now going to take the Trump legal situation and make it different than everyone else in the United States. So anyway, uh, hope some of these inside baseball kind of geeky details about the process is helpful to you. I don't usually do a lot of Trump stuff, but sometimes I feel like I need to because there's teaching points in these cases to help you understand all of our rights, including our right to keep and bear arms. Because again, like the spider web, Everything is connected up when it comes to the law. So it's helpful to know some of these other aspects of the law because it will help you protect your right, including the right to keep and bear arms. All right. All right, folks. Hope you learned a little bit something here today. Don't forget to subscribe. A lot of people are getting, uh, they're, they're unsubscribed apparently. So please subscribe here on YouTube and other channels. And don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner. And we will see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order's up. Table 2A.